Hi, this is Remembering the Past, the show where we talk about people who've died recently who've had a profound effect on our history, our society, or our culture. We're going to start with our feature tonight, Tom O'Hara, who died recently at the age of 77, one of the greatest athletes in Chicago history. He was the top indoor miler in the world in 1963 and 64, graduate of St. Ignatius High. He went to Loyola, one of the greatest athletes in Loyola history. And he made the cover of Sports Illustrated when he broke the world indoor record for the mile at 356.4 on national television on the wide world of sports at the Chicago Stadium in front of 18,000 people. The mile was a big deal in those days. He was also on the Olympic team in 1964, but he had the flu and couldn't compete. Here's the Loyola newsletter on Tom O'Hara. The Loyola University Chicago community mourns the passing of Ramblers cross-country track legend Tom O'Hara, who passed away yesterday. This is a sad day for Loyola Athletics. Tom O'Hare is a legend not only at Loyola, but also in his sport, Loyola Director of Athletics Steve Watson said. For as accomplished as Tom was on the course and track, he was unbelievably humble and a true gentleman. Tom will sorely be missed by those of us in the Loyola community, and we extend our heartfelt condolences to his family and friends. O'Hare's accomplishments are plentiful, and he made a name for himself by capturing the NCAA Individual Cross Country Championship during the 1962-63 school year, and he went on to represent the United States in the 1500 meters at the 1964 Tokyo Olympic Games. This is a tough loss for the Loyola Athletics, Chicagoland, and running communities. Loyola head cross-country track and field coach Bob Thernhofer said, the name Tom O'Hare is synonymous with Loyola Athletics. That iconic image of Tom on the cover of Sports Illustrated is something that has inspired Ramblers over half a century and Tom's incredible achievements have shown our department that anything is possible through hard work, humility, and service. Tom's legend spans across the Chicagoland area and still inspires our team to this day. We lost quite possibly the greatest rambler of all time today, but Tom's legacy and inspiration lives on in the hearts and minds of our community and is forever entwined in the maroon and gold. In 1964, the Chicago native who attended St. Ignatius College Prep established the indoor world mile record with a mark of 356.6 in New York, then one month later, bettered that world record time with a 356.4 at the Chicago Stadium. One year earlier, he had become the first Illinois runner to break the four-minute barrier at 359.4. Well, as I said, the mile was a big deal in those days. It was covered extensively on television and in the newspapers, and here's the wide world of sports covering an indoor mile at the Chicago Stadium in front of 18,000 people with Bill Fleming and Jim Beatty, also one of the great milers in the world, on the call. Back to the Chicago Stadium, where more than 17,000 fans are hopeful of seeing the indoor mile run faster than this. 3.56.6. That's the world record held by Tom O'Hara. This is Bill Fleming along with Jim Beatty. And in just a short time, we're going to be seeing this banker's mile, which incidentally Jim Beatty won two years ago. Uh, Jim, you certainly are qualified as an expert to say what to look for as far as personal battles are concerned. Well, the stage is set for a tremendous race tonight. Tom O'Hara, the world record holder, the hometown crowd. I would think that Jim Irons probably would go out and set the tempo. Jim Grella from the L.A. Track Club, the chief threat, would probably remain on O'Hara's shoulder and follow him. Do you think this will bother O'Hara at all? The way he's been running lately, I don't think too much is going to bother him. We're calling him uh, at the starting line right now, so it's a good opportunity for us to set the field for you. Here's Tom O'Hare, lane one, wearing number one from Loyola University of Chicago. World indoor record holder, 356.6. He's going last, Bill. Look at him go. Everybody's standing there, thinking that this could very well be a new all time world indoor mark. He might even break the outdoor record right here. That would be a sensational thing. He might do it. The outdoor man, 354-4. Here he comes. 356 Tom O'Hara has broken the confidence of three weeks ago of 356 by three tenths of a second. We'll be back in just a moment to see if he has set that new world mark on ABC's Wide World of Sports. Well, here it is officially a new world indoor mark. Three minutes, 56 and four tenths seconds. He clipped two tenths of a second off the mark set three weeks ago, and Tom, you must be a very happy guy to do it in front of the home crowd tonight. I am. I want him to do that. I'm very glad that I had enough luck uh, in Chicago. Uh, I have to give all the credit to uh, Jim Irons. He was uh, 
very good pace setter. I, I got to give credit for a uh, person who was just for sake winning the race and just go out there for someone else's benefit and set the pace. Without him, uh, it just wouldn't be possible. Very modest statement, and congratulations to you, Tom O'Hara, for another great performance, and we've been thrilled by it. So there you've seen it, uh, 3.56, 4 o'clock. Well, we're going to move on now to Al Haynes, who died recently at the age of 87. He was the pilot in charge of United Flight 232. In 1989, that flight was on its way from Denver to Chicago when an engine failed. The plane went into total hydraulic failure. Al Haynes was at the controls, and with the help of three other pilots, he maneuvered the DC-10 to a miraculous crash landing in Sioux City, Iowa, and 184 of the 296 people on board survived. He's widely considered as a hero among aviation experts, and he's been compared to Chesley Sully Sullenberger and the Miracle on the Hudson. Sullenberger got a whole lot more publicity, but what Haynes did was equally as hard. He just didn't get as much publicity, and part of that has to do with the fact that 112 of the people did die during the Sioux City landing. And there's some very famous footage of it on YouTube that you can check out. Here's the Chicago Tribune with an editorial on Al Haynes. It remains one of the most shocking incidents in aviation history. United Airlines Flight 232 bound for Chicago from Denver loses its hydraulics when an engine explodes, threatening to send nearly 300 passengers and crew to a frightful and certain death. After 44 minutes of barely controlled flight, the plane lands in Sioux City, Iowa, where it flips onto its back and bursts into flames, all captured in a dramatic video. There were 112 deaths, but 184 on board survived. Pilot Al Haynes, who died not that day in 1989, but this past Sunday at age 87, was celebrated as a hero whose mastery prevented the worst this disaster could have wrought. The story calls to mind that of Captain Chesley Sullenberger, who landed a U.S. Airways plane on the Hudson River in 2009 after birds disabled the plane's engines. America watched with its breath held as Sully saved the day and all 155 people on board survived. Haynes lived for 30 years after the United crash with a more complicated narrative, one that blended tragedy with triumph. He mourned the 112 in his care that day who died. Survivors were injured or traumatized. Haynes himself was battered with a concussion and 92 stitches in his scalp. As a captain, I felt I was responsible for each and every one of those people's safety, he said in 1999. Overcoming that mentally was very hard to deal with. It's often said that leaders get too much credit when things go right and too much blame when they go wrong. In the most challenging and dramatic circumstances imaginable, at the helm of a passenger plane at 37,000 feet with an engine in shards and control of his DC-10 failing, Haynes kept his head and saved lives by bringing down the plane at the Sioux City Airport. You want to be particular and make it into a runway, huh? He even joked to air traffic control, dissipating tension for a moment after a controller cleared all of the airport's concrete ribbons for the inevitable crash landing. Afterward, Haynes did not cultivate an image of the hero as solo swashbuckler. Like Sully, he credited his training, even for mastering circumstances beyond nightmares. Amid the crisis, Haynes welcomed assistance from his crew and a DC-10 trainer who happened to be on the flight. Haynes was a leader who was willing to listen and integrate the experience of others as he'd been trained to do. The pilot, he noted, wasn't always the smartest person in the room. In subsequent years on the speaking circuit, Haynes stressed this need for collaborative leadership. He advocated to improve airplane safety, and he reminded audiences that it was okay to need to work through trauma. You can't get over any type of trauma or tragedy without talking about it, he told the Sioux City Journal in 2010. I've given over 1,500 talks, and it has helped me accept what has happened. His good work didn't end on the runway. Yet given the shock of seeing that plane break apart and burn, and then to learn that, unbelievably, so many passengers walked out of the wreckage, some couldn't help but see it as a miracle, and the pilot is the instrument of that miracle. Like Sully, Haynes became a symbol of human common capability beyond most people's imagining, and he's just the kind of hero all of us hope to see every time we peer into the cockpit. Well, all I can say is amen to that. We're going to close tonight with Bill McInerney, who died recently at the age of 66. He wasn't a hero in the classical sense of the word, but he was a heroic figure as a common man who developed a debilitating neuromuscular condition as a young man and saw one of his sons die in a car accident a month before he died. Here's one of the best obits I've ever read by a non-journalist, his friend Bob Puglisi, and I thought I'd share it with you. It's called The Toughest Man I Ever Knew. What makes a man? 
makes him the one people talk about. For some, it is devotion to duty or country, the kind that manifests itself in acts we call courageous. For others, it is the ability to rise above the ordinary through talent or hard work to be the best. But there is no soldier, no fighter, no football player, no one at all that is any tougher or more of a man than a man I have called a friend for six decades. As a child, he was forced to homeschool second grade due to a bout of rheumatic fever. That couldn't stop him. When he rejoined his classmates, he was told to take a seat when the rest of us ran laps, burning with anger at being treated as someone less able than the rest. He grew stronger and bloomed for a while, excelling at sports, especially his favorite baseball. But his fate was elsewhere, and in his late teens, his considerable athletic talents began to falter, inexplicably but inexorably. A seemingly invincible young man, at the dawn of his manhood, a mere 20 years old, he was given a life sentence. He would have a rare, incurable, and debilitating disease that threatened to take from him the ability to do physical labor, play ball with his friends, and even to become a father. At first, the treatment was worse than the disease, causing him to swell such that he became a bloated caricature of himself. As the doctors refined his medicines and dosages, he slowly normalized in size, but there was a catch-22. The more he did to rebuild the strength, the worse it got, leaving him little choice but to serve as a host to this parasite until the day it consumed him. Somehow he fought back, refusing to accept the inevitable. He decided he would live his life with a middle finger directed squarely at this ugly interloper infecting his body. He would finish electrical apprentice school. He would eschew a desk job to apply his trade as a journeyman electrician working in the field for 35 years. He would marry his high school sweetheart. He would have three children to whom he would endow his considerable athleticism and work ethic, never missing any of their games. And finally, he would beat back the disease long enough to see his children marry and give him beautiful grandchildren. Somehow he made this disease allow him these victories, but it was there for the long game. Slowly it played its hand and took what it wanted. His muscles withered to nothing, his hands became cracked and then hardened into clubs, losing almost all function, including the ability to drive or open a bottle or button a shirt or buckle a belt. It took enormous pride, forcing him to seek help in ways that made him compromise his own sense of dignity in ways he never could have imagined. Sometimes it took his ability to swallow food and at other times even to breathe. It took his lungs and his heart. It sat him down and told him not to move or it would punish him with exhaustion. It took him to doctor after doctor and hospital after hospital. It took him to a corner of the couch and left him there. He took it all without complaint, though each little indignity burned at his pride. His acceptance of his fate without complaint was an inspiration to everyone who knew him, a reminder to all to count their blessings. He took it all because he told himself God would protect his family as his reward for his suffering. He could take whatever the horrible invader in his body could dish out for as long as he had to for the welfare of his family, the thing that mattered the most to him. Then God did the unthinkable, denying any covenant and taking his son suddenly, without warning, and in the prime of his well-lived life. Why, 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 why him, why now, why so cruel? The disease did not care that he was in pain. It took a few more bites, a little more of his pride, a little more of its dignity. Those that came to pay their respects to Matthew, and the line went on and on, found him in a wheelchair, the compromise he swore he would never make. He greeted them all with grace and then bowed his head and said nothing as we said goodbye to his beautiful son. For 46 years he had fought the killer that took up residence in his body. He fought with a determination beyond comprehension, knowing he could not win but taking victories the disease was not used to giving. He suffered every indignity without complaint, without asking, why me? He just toughed it out and did the best he could for himself, but mostly for his family. I will always remember him, always love him, and always thank him for teaching me never to feel sorry for myself, which I am sorely tempted to do, knowing that he won't be with us anymore. He was no Medal of Honor winner, no All-Pro, no World Champion. He was just the toughest man I ever knew, my friend Billy Mack. Well, I'm going to close on that note. I want to thank my producer and IT genius, Sid Tepps. As a final tribute to Billy McInerney, a tough man, we're going to play a song by a tough cowboy who also died too young. A little bit of Marty Robbins and The Master's Call. Mm -hmm. No more to fear the angry waves upon life's stormy sea. Forgiven by the love of God, a love that will remain. I gave my life and soul the night the Savior called my name. 